down in uh, Recife. Uh, how many of you have seen the, uh, the slide presentation from Recife? One, two, three, not many of you haven't. Uh, uh, well, anyhow, I wrote down to find out how much one of those dormitories cost, and uh, I haven't heard back yet, but the money's really been coming in. I see how much uh, faith y'all got. How many believe that we've already uh, either got in hand or definitely pledged over a hundred dollars? How many believe that? Two hundred. All right. Three hundred. All right. Goodness. Four hundred. Five hundred. Right. Six hundred. Now let me tell you, almost eight hundred dollars has already been raised. Isn't that something? <laughs> Hardly I mean, just people come up to me and say, "Well, I'm gonna give so much," and somebody else says, "I'm gonna give so much." It's already almost eight hundred dollars. Isn't that something? All right. I mean, when this group plans to do something, they plan to do something. Okay, Book of Acts. I believe we're going to really get it, don't you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Whatever it is. You don't know how much it's going to cost. <laughs> Whatever it is. Why, why did they write them that it doesn't cost us $700? Tell them about some things. We're in the Book of Acts and the event about what which we're going to read happened sometime within a 10-day period in history. You'll recall that uh, when Christ rose from the dead, he appeared unto his own, only to those who knew him. He appeared unto them over a 40-day period. And then on the 40th day after the resurrection, he arose from this earth into the glories uh, as we see recorded in Acts 1-9. And then uh, 50 days after the resurrection, uh, something very spectacular took place. And uh, this that we're going to read about, beginning in the 15th verse, happened during that 10-day interim. That is, during the 10 days after Christ uh, ascended into the glories, uh, having been... Uh, here on earth, 40 days after his resurrection, in this uh, event which happened 50 days after his resurrection. So we want to read these verses again, Acts 1, 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together was about 120, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas who was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst asunder in the midst, and all of his bowels gushed out. It was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that, as that field is called in their proper tongue a caldema, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishop, bishopric, let another take. Now in this little discourse by Peter, he actually quotes from three different Psalms, each of the three of which uh, predict something concerning Judas. Altogether, there are four psalms which speak prophetically of, uh, of Judas, and of course these psalms were written some 1,000 years before Judas was ever heard of. So he was infamous uh, before he was ever born by, by a long ways. And just so that you're familiar with these scriptures, and because of the profit that we get from comparing scriptures with scriptures, let's look at these psalms. The first of the four would be Psalm 41, and that is not one of the ones which, um, which Peter quotes. He quotes from the other three, but look in Psalm 41, verse 9. And the psalmist says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. 
Now Jesus quoted this verse in John 13, 18, and he said it referred to Judas. See, uh, Peter quoted from the other three which we're going to look at, and the Lord himself, uh, on the night uh, before he was crucified, uh, quoted this passage from Psalm 41, verse 9, and said that it was prophetic of Judas, so we don't have to remember whether it was or not. Now this is the first scripture in the Bible that speaks directly of Judas, but he is prefigured in the Old Testament, in the historical books. For instance, he's prefigured way back in the book of Genesis. You remember the story uh, of Joseph having been sold uh, for a certain number of pieces of silver? Well, here's something strange about the selling of Joseph. In the first place, it's very evident that Joseph is a type of Christ. I have in my Bible marked forty-some different ways in which Joseph was typical of Christ. For instance, uh, he was a shepherd, and he was sent by his father to seek his lost brethren. And he was uh, hated of his own brethren and, and uh, delivered uh, by his brethren uh, into uh, captivity. And then uh, uh, he was uh, 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 taken into custody uh, between uh, two thieves, so to speak. You remember the baker and the, what was the other guy, the butler? And one of these was saved and one was lost, if you remember. And uh, he... Uh, uh, he was, uh, although he was rejected by his brethren, he turned out in the end to be their savior. And while he was in rejection, he married a Gentile wife. There's just uh, a number of these analogies. Well, isn't this interesting? The fourth son of Jacob was a man named Judah. Joseph was the eleventh son of Jacob. And uh, it was Judah who offered him for 20 pieces of silver. Now Judah and Judas are exactly the same name in two different uh, languages. So there is a sense in which Judas is prefigured by the activity of his uh, namesake, uh, which uh, was Judah. Judas Iscariot was named for Judah, and Judah uh, was the one who uh, betrayed or sold Joseph, his brother, for 20 pieces of silver, and yet, um, and, and this same Joseph typifies Christ. So you see, uh, before you get a, a Bible character, he's foreshadowed. Now, Judah is not the only individual in the Old Test Testament that foreshadows Judas. Uh, there's a, the story of a man and that story begins in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 15. And the name of the man is Ahithophel. Now, you may have never heard of Ahithophel, but he's a type of Judas. The king, David, had just been rejected by his own people. And in that rejection, he's a type of Christ. And then one came to have counsel with uh, the, the one who was uh, usurping uh, David's throne. And this one who gave counsel and, and gathered the group together to give the counsel uh, was named Ahithophel. And Ahithophel uh, had, a, uh, had a proposal. And that proposal was that he be given a band of men to go and capture David, which is a picture, of course, of uh, Judas asking for a band of men from the religious leaders to go and capture Christ. And then uh, to follow through with the analogy, when uh, Ahithophel's uh, counsel didn't pan out, he was so remorseful that he went and hung himself. Now, isn't that amazing? You can read that story, as I say, in the book of Second Samuel, and beginning in the 15th chapter, I believe you'll first find him mentioned in the 15th chapter, about verse 30, 31 or so. And then his story extends on into the 17th chapter of Second Samuel, and I believe it was there where he committed suicide. So he is typifying, he's looking forward to this man, uh, Judas. Now, uh, 
Another psalm where we find him uh, forecast or prophesied would be Psalm 55. And this is one of the psalms that we, we just read and from it uh, by quoting Peter or by reading what Peter said in quoting from this psalm concerning Judas. Psalm 55, verse 13, But it was thou, a man of mine equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance, or my familiar friend. And uh, you'll see that this was part of that passage we read, particularly uh, in Acts 1.16. Then in Psalm 69, verse 25, Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. Now, this is another one of the quotations uh, by Peter in, um, in Acts 1. And the fourth psalm that uh, gives this uh, preview of Judas would be Psalm 109. Psalm 109, verse 8. And this, of course, would be the most pointed one. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. See, that's the authority upon which uh, Peter uh, based his action. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Now, of course, the psalmists are not the only ones who, um, who prophesied of the coming of, uh, of Judas and his uh, nefarious ministry, but we also have a prophecy of him in the book of Zechariah, at the next to the last book in the Old Testament. And in Zechariah chapter 11, and there is an unmistakable reference to uh, the betrayal of Christ, which of course involved Judas. See? In 11, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter. A goodly price was I prized at of them, and I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now, you know, there is a, a certain um, heresy that has prevailed ever since Christ died on the cross. And this heresy says that uh, Jesus, when he was growing up, became a great student of the Old Testament, and he began to study all the passages of Scripture which told about the coming Messiah. You remember when he was 12 years old, he was found in the temple uh, learning from the, uh, from the religious leaders of the day. And uh, this heresy says that Christ became such a good student of the, of the Word and all that the Old Testament had to say about the Messiah that he was able to channel his life or bring about the, event, the events in such a manner that uh, he was proclaimed the Messiah. And that he, uh, that he obviously fulfilled Old Testament prophecy because he planned his life in order to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Now, uh, it's, it's easy when we look at Zechariah, which was written 500 and some years before Christ. It's very easy for us to see that that truly is a, is a heresy with a lot of holes in it. Because how could he have arranged, for instance, uh, to have himself sold for 30 pieces of silver? How could he have controlled that? And also, how could he uh, have uh, 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 brought about the purchase of this field with that amount of money while he was hanging on Calvary's cross? You see, it, it, it breaks down at every point, doesn't it? And, and it shows the foolishness of some of the, uh, the ways that man is devised in order to explain away the miraculous in Bible prophecy. There's no way that this type of a prophecy uh, could have been staged. It has to be that which God said. Now, uh, of course, the story of Judas himself is to be found in the Gospels. And the most complete story of Judas will be found in Matthew. And the some are, are troubled by the fact that the account in Matthew does not seem to mesh 
uh, with the account that Peter gives in Acts chapter 1. But if you'll take all of these things, evidently what happened, the, uh, you remember uh, in the Matthew account, Judas took the money and threw it at the feet, and he offered it back because he, he said he didn't want it. Uh, he said Christ was innocent and he didn't want uh, money for the blood of an innocent man. And so they wouldn't take it, so he cast it at their feet. And they, they didn't want it to be in the Lord's house, so they picked it up and went and purchased this field. But it was purchased in his name. They did that deliberately so they, they could say it was his purchase. They uh, did it uh, as agents for him. So it was all right to say that he purchased the field. Obviously, he, after he's dead, he could not have purchased it. Now, it was not in this field that he committed suicide. It was this field in which he... Uh, which he was ultimately buried, the potter's field. As far as his actual suicide came, evidently what he did was uh, uh, hung himself in a tree. And uh, then either in the process of hanging himself, uh, he, uh, uh, his body fell down the precipice and uh, uh, was burst asunder, or else when they cut him down, that's what happened. In other words, it, it, he may have hung himself rather high in the tree, and, and uh, that took place. So if you'll just mesh the two, it'll fit all right. Not a very uh, exciting story, but uh, uh, at least as gruesome as some you see on TV these days um, for people that want gruesome stories. So my purpose in bringing this to you is to show how the whole Bible ties together, no matter what the subject is. It's so marvelous. See? Now, we've been all the way back to Genesis, and we've tied this, this figure in with uh, the historical books in 2 Samuel and brought it on through the uh, Psalms and into the Old Testament prophets, into the books of the Gospel, and on into the New Testament historical book. So whatever the story is in the Bible, you see, although there were many different authors, who are uh, authored over vast periods of time, still each story is tied together. And this is how we know which books belong in the Bible. Someone just asked me. As a matter of fact, Saturday night, a week ago, I, uh, I spoke to a group of young people who meet in Lakeland uh, on Saturday nights. And they are mostly a, a group of college kids. And most of them go to secular colleges or uh, colleges that would not exactly be considered fundamental, and but they gather together on Saturday night to uh, to sing uh, songs of praise and also to more or less get up their courage for the next week in the uh, world's battlefield. And they very frequently bring uh, unsaved people, young people, to these meetings. And uh, I thought almost everybody I've been there I've been there several times, and I thought everybody looked rather familiar. Uh, it was, school hadn't started yet, so it was a rather small group. And after the meeting, a young man came up to me and he says, you know, I've just discovered an amazing thing. And I says, what? He says, well, I have, uh, so he says, I'm Catholic, I'm Roman Catholic, and he says, I brought a Bible that I got from my priest. And he says, uh, you were reading uh, from uh, uh, a Protestant Bible, were you not? And I said, yes, I was. And he says, you know, uh, I could tell there was a slight difference in words, but they seem to say the same thing. What you read seemed to say the same thing as what I was reading. And, and he was amazed at it, you know, that uh, it would be that, uh, that near. And so uh, I said to him, oh, he said, ask me, he says, what is the difference between your Bible and our Bible? And I says, well, between the Bible that I'm holding in my hand and the Bible you're holding in your hand, there's considerable difference. Not in the actual text. If you were to look at a book in this Bible and look at the same book in your Bible, they would say, just as you found out, approximately the same thing. And we were going all through the Bible. And he was uh, seemed to be quite adept, because I didn't notice him uh, getting uh, too far behind. Uh, and. Uh, we were speaking of uh, being a bond slave for the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was extremely interested. I didn't know he was Catholic when he was talking. I just noticed that I just noticed that I was getting his undivided attention as we went along. So I said, uh, one big difference would be that you have a, 
a number of books in your Bible that won't be found here. Uh, they're called the Apocrypha. And uh, I said, they're what uh, we would call non-canical uh, books. And that means that they don't fit together. There's no threads that sew them together with the other books. Yeah. And I was able to point out to some uh, chain reference work we'd done. We'd gone, uh, we'd actually gone from, uh, from Genesis to Revelation. We had covered every single part of the Bible. And I said, now, there would be no words in those apoc apocryphal books which would have fit into any of those chains. Uh, you see, there's a red thread of redemption all the way through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, there's a golden thread of his ma majestic kingship all the way through the Bible. There's a blue thread of, an, of a heaven-sent one all through the Bible. And these you'll find all through the Bible, a scarlet thread and a golden thread. But you won't find those threads in the apocryphal books. And that's how we can know by the Spirit of God which books belong in the Bible and which ones don't. And uh, it's easy to see that every book we have belongs there. It fits into this beautiful uh, unit that we have in God's Word. And then I said, there's another difference between the Bible that you hold in your hand and the one I hold in my hand. Both of them are annotated, and his had quite some notes in it. And I said, that means that the one who published the Bible wanted to help your understanding, or else he wanted to channel your thinking into his understanding. And I have those notes in my Bible, too. But the, bio, the notes would be vastly different. They just wouldn't say the same thing at all. And he says, well, I've been reading the notes in this Bible, and it seemed that uh, they were very helpful. Well, of course, they're helpful to channel you into the strict doctrine of Catholicism. That's what the, the notes in his Bible did. And uh, so he said, I said, do you have a, uh, any other Bible other than this? He says, no, I never looked at another Bible other than this one. And uh, I says, well, I, I have one I'd like to give you, and I happen to have some extra Schofield Bibles. And I went out and, and got him a Schofield Bible, and he promised to, to read it. And I know... The devil didn't want me to talk to that young man because we were standing outside and the Skeeters were just eating us up. <laughs> and both of us were slapping Skeeters all the time. We were trying to uh, talk together. So the mosquitoes kind of called a halt to the, uh, uh, to the conversation. But it illustrates the fact that we're able to know by the Spirit of God what books belong in the Bible because these threads go all together. You see, uh, we know that 2 Samuel belongs in the Bible, or it wouldn't have that typology that would bring us uh, to this ultimate end. And that would be our purpose for, for following through. Now, because uh, of Judas, and because uh, he was no longer among them, then uh, Peter took some action. And some would say Peter's action was very ill-advised. And uh, uh, some would say that um, he should have known better in view of Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them, see, they were under command, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Now, they were given a commandment, and this commandment had two parts. One, don't leave Jerusalem. Two, wait for the promise of the Father. Now, as we pointed out in an earlier meeting, they should have had no trouble at all knowing what Jesus meant by the promise of the Father. Because the night before his crucifixion, as they sat there in the upper room, he told them that the Father was going to send someone. And this one whom the Father would send was called the promise of the Father to them in the 
fourth chapter of Luke, after his resurrection, he, he said there that the promise of the Father will come not many days hence. And here he says, now wait for the promise of the Father. That was going to take place ten days after he said to wait. And so some would say that Peter had no business doing anything but waiting and staying assembled together. Now notice in verse 21 what he did. We're in Acts 1. Wherefore, of these men, Peter's talking now, uh, he just finished talking about Judas, and he says, Wherefore, of these men who have uh, accompanied, accompanied us, uh, with us, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now what Peter's saying is, we've got to find somebody who would make an acceptable twelfth person. See, now Judas didn't discontinue to be one of the twelve at his death. He discontinued being one of the twelve when he departed to betray Christ. Beginning at that time, he was no longer numbered among the twelve, was he? And uh, so he says that we've got to get another one. Now, his reasoning was not too bad from a reasoning standpoint because remember, and this is recorded in several places, including Matthew chapter 19, you remember in that chapter, Peter asked the Lord a question. He was talking about forsaking all. And he says, now, Lord, we've forsaken all and followed you. What shall we have? And Jesus says, when I come into my kingdom, you twelve shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He says, I'm going to set up a kingdom, and my twelve apostles, will sit on twelve thrones. Well, Peter knew that that couldn't be fulfilled unless there were twelve apostles. And now there were only eleven. And he knew that Judas wasn't going to sit on the throne. And so he felt like the practical thing to do was to get a twelfth. And maybe if they could get a twelfth, the Lord would come back and establish his kingdom and they could start that throne sitting business because that was considerable considerably better than what they've been accustomed to in recent days. So uh, this looked like a, uh, a wise thing, and he says it would have to be somebody that would fit, and to fit, he'd have to, be, have to be somebody who had followed Jesus Christ from the very beginning, from the baptism of John, and had witnessed the resurrection. He says it's got to be one of those. Now, there's no indication that the Holy Spirit <coughs> He wasn't, hadn't even come to direct them yet, so there, there's no indication that the Lord had told them that. But uh, they, uh, Peter has a plan, and it says in verse uh, 23, And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabas, uh, uh, who was uh, surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which of these two thou hast chosen. Well, some would say, what kind of a deal is this? They picked the two they like, and then said, Lord, now we picked our two, now you choose among them. That's like some of us uh, choose preachers these days, you know. Uh, we say, now we, we, we get a pulpit committee, and we say, now, Lord, what we want is for you to send us a preacher. And then we say, but you have to send him among these from among these. I don't know, it was this group or somebody else. I was telling about this person I know very well. was on the pulpit committee, and he uh, came to my town. Uh, he was from Daytona Beach. came to my town to listen to one of the preachers there in one of the big churches uh, because he was on the pulpit committee, and he had to find somebody for their church who didn't have a preacher, and he had a list of the qualifications, and the top of the list was he must have a doctorate. He must be able to say so-and-so DD. That was the first requisite. And so you see, what we do, we set up these requirements. Uh, first of all, he would have to be from our denomination all, all, after all. Uh, it's this, this is the brand we are, and so he's got to be our brand, and he's got to be graduated from the right 
place and he's got to have a certain background and so forth. Now, Lord, that we have uh, uh, put out the specifications, you select us one from among those specifications. Well, it, it would seem as that's kind of what Peter did. He's, he established the specifications. It's going to have to be like this. Now, I don't know whether he could only find two people that would fit the qualifications or whether he only found two that was, were wanted to be a part of it or, or just how they arrived at two. But anyway, they got the thing now down pretty well to two. And then they started praying. Now, there's no indication in here that they prayed about this matter before they got the two picked out. Uh, but they, uh, uh, and, and the fact that the prayer is emphasized at that time, and they just didn't know which of the two, you see. They, uh, to, as far as they were concerned, they could have picked either one. I, I suspect, suspect that many a pulpit committee has come down to that point. They got it now with the two, and they just had, don't know which of the two. So then they go into deep prayer and say, Lord, help us select the one that you would have. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, Show which of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place, that is Judas. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. I suppose after they prayed, they say, well, the Lord will uh, choose by lot. Uh, and there's a proverb that says uh, the... Um, the lot is cats cast into the lap, but the disposing is of the Lord, or something like that. Uh, Proverbs 16:33. Maybe somebody ought to uh, look that up. Edna, you got you got Proverbs in your Bible? Look up Proverbs 16:33, 16:33, and read that, and we'll see what it says. You already found Proverbs? Now all you got to do is find 16. All right, read it. Commit thy work unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Well, that wasn't the verse I thought it was going to be. I'm sure you read it right, but... Uh, yeah, I think she read the verse I told her to. Did she? 1633, try that. But, yeah, that's it. The lot, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. I suppose Peter was kind of claiming that uh, verse, wouldn't you think, in that uh, in that situation? Now, most of you can tell by the way I presented this subject uh, that uh, I kind of taken sides and uh, uh, sort of against poor old Peter. And now that uh, that would make a good number of people very unhappy, because you see this particular scripture is used to define what an apostle is, in many cases, and uh, uh, they would say, "Well, Peter must have been; he must have received these instructions of the Lord." The Bible just doesn't uh, tell us because he he used the scriptures, and he, he quoted from three Psalms. <laughs> in arriving at his procedure, and he took a scriptural principle, uh, an Old Testament scriptural principle, and so uh, and there did need to be another apostle. Um, the first individual that got me started uh, thinking about this was a Bible teacher by the name of M. R. DeHaan. He died 10 to 12 years ago, and uh, he says that uh, uh, Paul should be the twelfth apostle. He said that uh, the Lord uh, was going to select Paul and they should have just waited for the Lord to do it. And when uh, those twelve apostles sit on those twelve thrones, uh, that it'll be Paul sitting on one of them. And uh, you won't find Matthias anywhere around. And, of course, others would say, no, that couldn't be because those twelve, ap those twelve apostles are, uh, are to the Hebrew nation, and uh, it's judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and God sent 
Paul to the Gentiles. But, you know, all of his life Paul had a real heart to the Jew, and he always went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And so the other side could say, no, God's going to give Paul his heart's desire. He's going to have a part in the administration of the Jewish nation when they come into the glory. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin. As a matter of fact, he's probably about the only one of them we know what tribe he belongs to. Uh, he, uh, we know if he's sitting on one of those twelve tribes that the tribe he'll be judging will no doubt be Benjamin, because that's the tribe he's from. He says he is, from the pri uh, tribe of Benjamin. Now, I don't know which way is right here. I don't know if Peter was outside of the scopes, uh, scope of the Lord's commandment or not. But I would think from the overall, overall way in which the Bible presents a subject matter that we could conclude that this is another instance of Peter's impulsiveness. And you know, he did a lot of things on the spur of the moment. The Lord certainly didn't want him to take that sword out and chop off Malchus's ear, did he? But he did it anyhow. And so before the Holy Spirit came upon him, uh, Peter did a lot of things with good intentions, uh, but uh, with the wrong results. And without waiting to get instructions, remember when he rebuked Jesus and said, you will not go up to Jerusalem. And, uh, and Jerusalem said, get thee behind me, Satan. Looked right at him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, Peter, you're being directed by Satan, not by God, in what you're saying. And then uh, uh, you'll notice Peter was the one that says he wouldn't deny him whatever. And uh, uh, we could think of a number of other things, couldn't we? That he, uh, he did or said without thinking before he did it. Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and all of that glory there, he came up with something. He classified Jesus right along with Moses and Elijah. And if you read the story carefully, he shouldn't have never said anything. So he had a history of, of speaking when he ought to have been quiet. Who can else can think of a time? Did he mention that he washing my feet? Yes, how about then? He said, uh, Thou shalt wash my feet, or you'll never wash my feet. And uh, then um, uh, Jesus says, if I wash you not, you have no part in me. And uh, he says, well, wash me all over. He shouldn't have said either one of those things, see. And the Lord had to say, no, you, 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 just, you got it all wrong, Peter. So I just think this is another instance of the Spirit of God faithfully, reco faithfully recording that which happened just the way it happened. And... Uh, that it's to emphasize the difference. Peter, after the coming of the Spirit, he wouldn't have thought of doing anything except at the Lord's direction. But still, you know, he didn't lose his personality. Remember when the Lord told him to take and eat? And he said, not so, Lord. How can you say not so, Lord? So, you see, if we take Peter's personality, it, this is not outside of the scope of his uh, mode of conduct to go ahead and uh, have a system for getting something done. So uh, really you got two questions here. The question number one is, should or should not have uh, Matthias been selected? And number two is, if there, if there is a twelfth apostle, which there certainly is somewhere, is it Paul? I would be a little less sure of that part, whether or not the, the twelfth one that the Lord had in mind was Paul. But I would tend to favor that without uh, uh, telling you you're just all wet if you think the other way about it. But notice uh, in verse 26, And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was numbered with or among the twelve apostles. Everybody doesn't agree with the way I read that. Now, it doesn't say he was numbered among the twelve apostles. He was numbered with the eleven, and he was by them. Now, the question is, was he numbered among the twelve? 
by the Lord. Anyway, that's interesting, isn't it? And then let's uh, bring out again this other truth that from here on through the entire New Testament, now we're in the very first chapter that tells us what happened after Christ went back to the glories. We're just in the first few verses of those, that chapter. And here you'll never hear any of these twelve ever mentioned again. Not any one of them will be named again in the New Testament except Peter, James, and John. Only those three. The other nine will never be mentioned again. Now, church tradition has a complete history for every one of them. Uh, church uh, tradition sends one to India and one to Ethiopia and one over here and one over here and it has a spectacular death for each one of them. I don't know if that's true or not. On an overall basis, I have very little confidence in church tradition because I don't have confidence in the channel through which church tradition uh, was transmitted. I have every uh, confidence in what we have in the Word under the protection of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I know that there are many very, very... Uh, uh, spiritual Christians, very fine, uh, dedicated Christians, uh, who, uh, who think very highly of the veracity of the information that has come down to us through church, uh, through church history, of church tradition. Uh, but just, I, I, as a personal quirk, if that's what it is, I just don't have any confidence in it. I don't, I, it doesn't register on my mind as uh, as truth, I don't deny it. I just don't uh, uh, let it cement itself. I, I never speak of it as something that actually was. For instance, uh, church tradition has it. I understand with much veracity that Peter was crucified upside down, but it's not in the Bible. And there's quite a story that goes along with it, with much detail. And uh, I don't know if that's true or not. I tend to disbelieve it, but uh, that just may be because I'm generally skeptical of uh, church tradition in toto. And I certainly wouldn't deny it. And I wouldn't call anybody uh, stupid or uh, unspiritual because they accepted a good deal of it. After all, I, uh, I accept uh, most of what I read about George Washington, and even a good deal that I read about Julius Caesar, for instance, without any problem. In other words, when I read about what happened to Julius Caesar and Brutus and Anthony and so forth, I take most of it as fact. Now, isn't that strange? It must be just me. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And uh, there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own tongue. Now, if you think I misread that last word, I did it on purpose because in the original language, in the original uh, writings, the word language in chapter 6 is exactly the same word as the word tongues in verse 4. Uh, the, so they were speaking in languages. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these who speak Galileans? Now, we think from this that perhaps the only ones that were actually 
speaking were the uh, eleven apostles. Uh, because they were all Galileans, were they not? However, there were a number of other Galileans there. But uh, it says here that all of these that were involved in this tongue uh, speaking here were Galileans. In verse 8, how hear we every man in our own tongue or our own language wherein we were born? And look at the list of countries here. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, in Phrygia, in Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers or sojourners of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now that's more than 11 different languages, of course, and uh, I don't know uh, how many different languages each individual used, but certainly it's clear enough that these individuals were empowered to speak a language that they never learned. And they were languages that could be heard and understood by the hearer. In other words, God empowered these men to speak the gospel message in a language that they had never heard. And this is an amazing thing, isn't it? That, uh, that such a thing could take place. Well, this is uh, very interesting from one standpoint because in a way it un undid what happened at that other big tongues occasion at, at the Tower of Babel. See, that was kind of the opposite, wasn't it? We'll talk about that some next week. But I want to talk about this word Pentecost. And the, re the reason I read on down that far is because it helps us to understand Pentecost. First, the word Pentecost simply means 50th, 50th. And uh, uh, by inference, it means the 50th day. And we'll see how it came to have that meaning as we go along. So when somebody says, I've had a great Pentecost in my life, what he's saying is, I've had a great 50th in my life. Must be 50 years old. Uh, anyway, uh, if they were speaking literally, that's what they'd be saying. Oh, you know, sometimes you speak of a, a church having a great revival. They had a Pentecost. Well, what they had was a 50th. You know, we went to that church and the guy that preached and a lot of people got saved and all. My, what a 50th they had. Uh, literally, that's what we're saying. And uh, uh, when a person calls himself a Pentecostal, he's a 50th. Uh, of course, you know, words change meanings because of usage. And uh, But I thought you might be interested in, in how it sounds when you uh, put the word into it its... Uh, actual meaning, literal meaning. So what does, uh, why was it called Pentecost? And what significance is there in this 50th business? Okay, we're going to leave Acts now, so you don't need to hold your place there. And we want to go to the 23rd chapter of Exodus. And there we'll find some instructions that were given to the children of Israel concerning the time that they would enter the promised land. And these are instructions on the part of God. Exodus chapter 23, beginning with the 14th verse. And God says, Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of the unleavened bread. That's the first one. Thou shalt eat uh, unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month of Abib. Now that was the first month of the year, and their uh, year began uh, with the uh, vernal equinox, which would be uh, about uh, the first full moon after the, the vernal equinox, or just about when we would, uh, the first new moon that is, or a little before we would begin Easter. And uh, so it would be uh, in the late, late part of March or the early part of April. This is when this month Abib was. And so he says, I want all of the men to gather together in the month of Abib for seven days, 
for in it thou camest out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Now, he's, that's the first time. Then in verse 16, number 2, And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labor, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering. So, there was three feasts. Number one, in verse 15, the feast of unleavened bread. In verse 16, the feast of harvest. And in verse 16, the feast of ingathering. There are three feasts. And it, and it says, in the end of the year, uh, then, uh, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Now here was what the commandment was. In the very beginning of the harvest, when the first sheaves of the barley would be getting ripe. See, the barley uh, uh, was planted in the fall of the year, and it grew during the winter time, and uh, then it was harvested in the springtime. In the, the, they would harvest the first sheep. And he says, I want you to gather together for seven days at the time you should begin your harvest. And then when your harvest is over, I want you to have another feast or gathering together. And that was called the Feast of Harvest to mark the end of the harvest time, which would be uh, sometime in, in our month of May, for instance. And then they had a long dry summer when there was no real activity in the fields until the end of the year, when the grapes would get ripe. Uh, have any of you been reading in the paper that the drought in Europe has called, uh, caused a bumper crop of grapes? They said that uh, England is going to have the best uh, grape crop they've ever had. And in Portugal, in Spain, the, the port is going to be of great vintage. Uh, by the way, that's where the name port came from. And then... Uh, uh, in uh, France, they're going to have a vintage year, they say, like they never had. Why? Because it, it does something to the grape juice when they have a long dry spell. The grapevine doesn't mind that. It's got a tap root that gets down deep enough to get the moisture out, and it uh, brings about a better crop. And so the grape crop was harvested after. See, there was no rain in, in the Holy Land. The rain ceases about the 1st of May. And then there's no rain through October. Then it begins to rain again. So uh, they harvest the, the, uh, the fruit of the vine then in the fall of the year. So they had these three, they had this, that was called the Feast of the End Gathering when they gathered in the grapes or the last of that which was harvested. And that was called the end of the year because it was the end of the harvest year. Now here's what they did then. Every man in Israel who reached, had reached his 20th birthday and who had not yet reached his 60th birthday, every man in that age bracket, unless he was a cripple, he had to come those three times. He was asked to come before the Lord those three times in the year. Now, he could bring his family if he chose to, but the, but the families were not ordered to come. As a matter of fact, one place uh, where we'll have this God specifically promises to take care of the families, to look over them, and uh, he promised that none of them would be attacked by robbers or none of them uh, would be uh, hurt in any way while their men folk were gone up to minister to the Lord and they could safely leave their families at home without any kind of defense whatsoever because God had called them these three times and they were to go up to Jerusalem uh, to honor the Lord. Now, after these instructions were given in Exodus, Moses was given, was given the Ten Commandments, and then the children of Israel broke the Ten Commandments. And then, in order for them to know that God had received their repentance, he gave all of this information about entering the land over again. Now, they weren't to do this until they entered the land. And so, to let them know that they were accepted, he gave all of these instructions over again, and we find those in Exodus chapter 34. See, in Exodus 34, verse 18, The feast of unleavened bread thou shalt keep, seven days thou shalt keep it, as I commanded thee in the time of the month of Adib, in the month of Adib, when thou comest uh, from Egypt. Now, in verse 22, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of the harvest of wheat and the feast of ingathering. Now here, 
in the first place it was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering. Here it's called, the middle one is changed, and it's called the Feast of Weeks. Now why do you suppose it was called the Feast of Weeks? That's in uh, Exodus 34, 22. Now, this is explained to us because God's not through with these three times. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, Moses gives the instructions to the second generations, the children of these that are receiving it here. And in between, these three feasts are discussed in great detail, and that is in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, in Leviticus, and we'll, we'll finish up there. In Leviticus chapter 23, and there you're going to find that instead of three feasts, it's seven feasts. That's because the first feast was three in one. For seven days they ate unleavened bread. Uh, that began with the Passover, which was called the Feast of the Passover. And sometimes in the Bible you'll have the whole seven-day period <laughs> called the Passover, going up to Jerusalem for the Passover, and sometimes it's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. See, the Passover was included within that seven-day week. And then, in the first day after the Sabbath during that week, they had the first Feast of the First Fruits. <clears throat> it always came... Now, if you had a seven-day period, there'd be one Sabbath day during that seven days, wouldn't it? Well, whatever day Sabbath came on, and it came on a different day, it didn't always come on... Uh, I mean, the Sabbath always came uh, the same day, the seventh day. But the... Uh, the feast didn't always begin the same day. It began, began the same day of the month, but it didn't get, begin the same day of the week. Just like today. The first day of the month isn't always Monday or Sunday. It changes. Why? Uh, well, we understand why. Back then they went by the moon. And the new moon didn't begin every month on the same day of the week, did it? Doesn't now, it didn't then. So, but somewhere in a seven-day period, there has to be a Sabbath day, doesn't it? Well, the day after the Sabbath day that occurs during that seven-day Feast of the Unleavened Bread, that's the day they had the Feast of the First Fruits. And what would happen is the priest would go and cut the first barley sheaf. Nobody was permitted to harvest any grain until the priest, high priest, did it on that particular day. And that marked the beginning of the harvest. And it, it did it in Jerusalem. And then they were all dismissed at the end of the, the seven days. And they went home and did their harvesting. Then at the end of the harvest, they came back again. Now, the Bible uh, tells us exactly when they came back. So, you see, in the first feast, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, there were really three in one. Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits all happened in the seven-day period. That was one of the three times. That was early in the spring, as I said. Now, these three feasts, according to the New Testament, are fulfilled in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The Passover stands for his death. The uh, unleavened bread for that whole passion, you might say, and the feast of and the first fruit stands for his resurrection. We needn't wonder about that because he is called the first fruits. He's the fulfillment of the first fruit. And that's why he rose from the dead on Sunday morning. And that's why we worship on Sunday, is because he was fulfilling the feast of the first fruits. And he is the first fruits from among the dead. We, you see, the Bible knows nothing about celebrating the resurrection of Christ once a year. If we went by the Bible, we'd celebrate the resurrection every first day of every week. That's why we meet on the first day of the week. It's not the Sabbath day. Somebody says, who ever changed the Sabbath? The Seventh-day Adventist are saying this. Who changed the Sabbath? Nobody changed the Sabbath. The Sabbath's always been on Saturday. It always will be on uh, uh, Saturday. And it's absolute scriptural error to call Sunday the Sabbath day. It's never been the Sabbath day. It never will be the Sabbath day. And it's an error to call it the Sabbath day. And nowhere in the Bible 
Well, you see, Sunday called the Sabbath day. So no wonder the poor Seventh-day Adventists think we're a bunch of nuts. Go around calling Sunday the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day Saturday. But we don't worship on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, is, again and again, the scripture says it's a sign between the nation of Israel and their God, and it has nothing to do with a non-Jew. The Sabbath day does not. Oh, we're all mixed up in so much of our worship procedure. But we meet together on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection because it's the, the, the feast of the first fruits is the fulfillment of that. Now notice, and this is going to tell us about the second time they, they met together. Verse 15, we're in Leviticus 23. And ye shall count unto you the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, shall ye number Pentecost, and ye shall offer a new uh, meat offering or meal offering unto the Lord. The reason the Holy Spirit descended on Pentecost, the fiftieth day, was because it was in fulfillment of the feast of the ingathering. And it had to happen the day after the Sabbath. And it was called Feast of Weeks because it was a week of weeks. You see, the, the word week is simply uh, means a heptad or a group of seven. That's what heptad means. And uh, so uh, you can have a heptad of days or a week of days or you can have a heptad of years. And in the Bible you do. Daniel's 70th week is seven years. Or you can have a heptad of weeks, and it's called the Feast of Weeks because it's seven weeks. You take the, the day that the priest goes out there and cuts that first uh, sheaf, then there's seven weeks to harvest. All of the barley, then the wheat, and all of the grain, and you've got to be through the harvest at the end of seven weeks because everybody goes back to Jerusalem. The harvest is over. And that's called the Feast of Harvest. It's called the Feast of Weeks. And it's called Pentecost. Now, it was first called the Feast of Harvest because it marked the end of the harvest. Then it was called the Feast of Weeks because it was a week of weeks after the last feast. Seven weeks. And then it was called Pentecost because that adds up to 50 days if you take the Sunday on both ends. You see, uh, you'd have eight Sundays involved, wouldn't you? You'd have seven weeks, but you'd have a Sunday on both ends. Now, if you count them up, it's 50 days. And all you have to do to get your 50 days is to count the Sunday, which was on both ends. Now, what does all of that have to do with this? Well, we'll start there next week because we're over time now. But the point we want to understand now is that the reason that the Holy Spirit descended on that day was not because the people were tarrying in the upper room. It was not because they were waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was because that's the only day that prophecy could be fulfilled. And uh, that's why the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, on the 50th day, because Jesus Christ had risen from the dead exactly 50 days before that, and there was no other proper time. Now, we're going to begin next week with why all of these people were there from all over these countries. But remember, it says devout men. It was the men that were following that law that God says you come three times a year. But now, you may not have known these, this, but we'll talk about it next week. The people that lived in the other countries, off, they only had to come twice a year. They didn't have to come three times. And but this is one of the times they had to come. And we'll explain. And, and God made that provision. Because, you see, they lived too far to travel that many times. And they only had to come twice. But the devout ones came. And that's why all of these people were there in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit came on the 50th day. We'll start there next week, shall we pray? 
Lord, we pray that you'd give us a real desire to study this book until we would think in the same terms that you think, and that we'd understand uh, that uh, Pentecost came because it was the 50th day, not for any other reason, and because it said uh, that it would do, would come that particular day. So, Lord, we pray that uh, you'd use this knowledge, this background in your scriptures to open up our understanding so that we could know in our own hearts just what happened in Jerusalem on that day. In Jesus' name, amen.